My name is Eric, and uh, Michael, I'm really excited to tell you I found a theme for today's show. Oh my god, well, I mean, of course, yeah. we, have, we always have themes, because that's we're a professional podcast, and we, we plan for things way ahead of time. Professional podcast. So, this is, uh, I mean, we did a great thing, finally, watching these movies. Mm-hmm. That was really the only reason I needed, is just, I want to watch Shame, and I want to watch I Saw the Devil. Is that the theme? That's a horrible theme. Well, it would have been a horrible theme, but I think... Uh, it, there is a question to consider on today's show, and that okay. is two sides of the same coin. Ooh, that's yeah, really right. Good. I you like got a that. little bit of that going. I like that. Oh, yeah, uh, big time. So you know, that's something that uh, may or may not be true in either film, but definitely uh, going to come up in a big way in uh, our conversation on both. So that's going to involve spoiling the movies. Yeah, we got to spoil them for people who who've never heard this show before, they can use the chapters, which is a feature we have, to right. skip over the movie they haven't seen. Other thing I did want to mention before we get into Shame. Shame's the first movie. What's the second movie? The second movie is I Saw the Devil. We're on our 600th episode of Double Feature, and I still don't know uh, how we do this. Shame and I Saw the Devil. Yeah, that's okay. The... This is episode 600? Episode 600. <laughs> Welcome. You've made it. Cool. I wanted to mention our Kickstarter. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, we don't have one yet. Nope. We're going to have more details about why we're doing a Kickstarter, what the incentives are. But for, uh, for the last time, you as an audience member can have some influence on what those incentives are going to be. So send us an email, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com, and let us know if you're going to make a pledge to Kickstarter, what do you want to get out of it? Besides a chance to pick some movies for our show. I know everybody yeah. wants that. Right. We figured that into the equation. That's before Kickstarter was even invented. There's also a lot, of, that part out. There's a lot of people that want to see us naked. Double feature show at gmail.com. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> I'll show you if you show me. Let's talk about shame. Speaking yeah, of, I think it's a good time <laughs> for <of> which, that. <laughs> wow. The first natural segue in a million episodes of, uh, of the show. I, so the poster is what lured me into shame. Of so really? many movies we the do. poster? Yeah. I, well, okay. there's, there's two different posters. I don't know if you've seen these, actually. I've seen one that's red and blue. Okay, I'm talking about... So there's one with the sheets, which is kind of interesting. It says shame. It shows some bed sheets. It's an interesting okay. poster. Definite, you know, association immediately. But there's also one that's really, really graphic that you'll love. The entire poster is just a picture of somebody's back with shame spelled out in cum. Uh, on their back. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. It's pretty amazing. I love when you you look at a poster and just instantly it's uh wow, that's offensive. I'm going to watch the movie. Yeah, that is officially when people come art, I feel like right. Come art is always offensive, to, not offensive, but it's one of those things where I don't I don't know. It makes a statement immediately. Well, it's yeah, I mean to take the time to artistically put come <laughs> in places. I sure. mean so it's the artistry that draws well, you into something like it's that. It's the artistic fortitude is what it is. You know, it'd be like if somebody were to make art out of vomit. Well, I mean, it could also be Elmer's glue, but I, just the imagery. They're not biological paint. I guess that carries over to the actual film. I mean, I, I certainly wasn't disappointed to find that, okay, visual aesthetic is going to be very, very important in shame. The way the shots are set up and... You know, keeping the characters in the end of the frame. Yeah. When you're talking about a, a two, three, five to one shot, your character is basically, if he takes a step backwards, he disappears from the line of sight of the, uh, of the movie. And, you know, they're doing a lot of these, these scenes that were probably hard to track doing that. All the running scenes, you know, there's, uh, I can think of at least two scenes with the character running, keeping right in the end of the frame. That sort of, distance that's in there i mean i think that's going to add a lot to the isolation the characters feel that it says a lot i guess about the distance they're putting up right kind of making you consider that and just as we talked about with silence of the lambs way back when they betray those ideas you know that'll say just the opposite going back through and watching shame and looking for the scenes where a character is centered 
you know, when Sissy's on stage mm-hmm. or um, right after the scenes with Nicole, you know, seeing her character centered in the middle of the frame, definitely a different place, you know, a different headspace that that character's in than running down the street, right. uh, distancing himself from stuff. I look at that aesthetic a lot because of the subtlety of this movie. This is one of the most subtle films we've ever covered on Double Feature. You think so? I do. Well, I think because, and I mean, I don't think it has anything to do with our typical taste because I don't think that plays into it. Sure. But this is one of those few films where a single line seems like it accidentally fell into a movie yeah. and it carries all the weight of the film. It's one of those films where a line is dropped almost as an afterthought in the conversation, Mm -hmm. but it provides a massive amount of insight into the character's backgrounds and the motivation for everything that's been going on. Well, it's subtext, right? Right. I mean, that's, you know, uh, the very definition. You're questioning every single line and going, how does this inform the situation? What are they, what are they feeding us right now? Right. It's especially impressive to me being a drama and not a mystery or science fiction the kind of way we would pour over something like primer right and look at every single line of primer and go what is this you know how what variable is this in the math equation of primer to help us right. solve this you would then rewatch primer and go oh now i understand what he means by this or this right and i think that's something shame does really well especially given that it's nowhere near any of those genres right you look at a scene like when he's beat up in that uh that post bar fight mm-hmm. And, you know, they're showing a little bit of the the time shifting with the scar. Yeah. And he's denied from that first club. Yeah. And they say, they don't just say, like, don't come in. They say, not tonight. Not tonight. Right. And, you know, then he goes to the gay bar and immediately gets to have sex. Cause, sure. Because, you know, Cause when it's you a line up bar. at a gay bar, that's, yeah. I mean, it's actually probably a sex club. So It's a gay, you know, gay sex club. Won't give the well, movie crap for the idea that you could just go to any gay bar and get laid immediately. Yeah, I, I, I understand so why do you the, think that is? Why do I think the not tonight? You know, I think that I think the information given is that maybe he gets so self-deprecating in in these moments of you know where he goes to a bar and intentionally hits on a woman. He doesn't give a shit that she has a man. And if you think of something like a nightclub, you know, I have the inside scoop on nightclubs. Let me tell oh, you. Sure. Um, Back in the day when you were a bouncer right. for a nightclub. Yeah. A job I still don't believe you had. <laughs> um, people will get thrown out of nightclubs for the, the dumbest shit just because basically because of, of fear of mom mentality, right? Sure. Where you have this person who's instigating a fight and you throw out not only the guy who starts the fight, you throw out everybody involved. Right. Even if they were innocent, even if they got hit and knocked down and their nose is bleeding and they were just a random punch that was thrown. If their nose is bleeding, they were involved in the fight, you get them the fuck out. Well, if somebody does that two weekends in a row, you're going to remember them. Yeah. You're going to tell them not to come in. You're going to, you know, profile them as a troublemaker and the reason the fact that he says not tonight instead of not anymore yeah is interesting because i'm trying to think are they waiting for him to cool down i mean well so he looks a little beat up and that was the first thing i thought is oh he looks rough they tell him not tonight but you know here's what we know about this character's history has some kind of what I guess on the surface you could describe as sexual addiction. Yeah. So let's assume this is some kind of sex club. He's going in and he's not thinking straight. He's had a couple drinks at this other bar. He just got in a fight. You know, he's a little bit rough. He's stumbling around. And they're letting what in my memory, I mean, I'll have to see it again, but um, is exclusively women into this club. Right. So this could be, you know, a sex club having a girl's night. Or, I mean, it's weird to specifically say not tonight, but that's one of those things, you know, you rewatch it and you get more context for it. Sure. We've gotten really deep into this without talking about uh, what the hell this movie is. This is a Steve McQueen movie. Right. Who did uh, Hunger. Hunger. He's bringing us an NC-17 movie, so it's really important we know his name. I love NC-17, man. But also Michael Fassbender, who we've discussed uh, a lot on the show. Michael (laughs) Fassbender. 
I know, right? That's the reason I wanted to see the movie. Completely sure, honestly, totally. Is films starring Michael Fassbender? That's a genre for me. Well, and also in a difficult role. Sure. Anything as sexual as this can be really challenging, mm -hmm. even aside from how much nudity there is. Sure. Well, it's uh, easy to take a role with this kind of depth and get carried away with the torment of the character. Yeah, right. It's difficult to really play a broad role on somebody who's on paper is, yeah, he had a rough childhood and now he's a sex addict. Sure. Imagine Nicolas Cage playing this role. Right? <laughs> he would look at everyone like he was hungry and he would probably be masturbating the entire movie. Sure. Well, it's small, uh, small drama, very few characters. You're, it reminds me of um, when we talked about hard candy. Yeah. We're spending so much time in a single place where we're relying on three people to carry the whole story and we have to be infatuated with them. And that's about what we have here. We also have um, Sissy, who's uh, Carrie Mulligan, who right. we saw in Drive. Yeah. And I think the relationship between the two of them is, I mean, it is at the core of the film. Sure. It's also one of the ways we learn a lot about the characters is by looking at, you know, that's what made me think about that two sides of the same coin idea. Sure. Seeing how they, you know, knowing they have the same upbringing, seeing how they react to different things right. or what, I guess even more so what the major conflicts in their life are because yeah. they're in very different places. Sure. But you can look at the two characters and ostensibly from the way the film is lined up and from the other small one-off lines that we get, the, um, what's the line that Sissy says? We're not bad people. Oh, yeah. On the voicemail in the end. Well, that's one of the most revealing things, right? right? Exactly. And we just come from a bad place. Right. And it's kind of this examination of two characters who, regardless of of even the entirety of their previous lives, there's some point, some catalytic moment, like a big bang, where they got sent off spinning in two completely different directions, but sure. from the same origin. Yeah, and I mean, I don't know how pointed an answer it gives us. Right. But we definitely know, all right, we're dealing with some kind of sexual baggage. Sure. Even if it's just, you know, even if that's only the symptom. To me, I didn't necessarily think it was definitely sexual. It definitely has to do with, you know, either, I don't know, not being loved or, or getting beaten as a kid. But I think that the most important thing to know about the two characters is that they weren't estranged this right. whole time they right. come from the same place sure and that's a dark place at some point they both hit a very dark moment and that is something that they both base the entirety of their life choices on yeah i don't think that uh that catalyst you're talking about is necessarily sexual in nature right it's just for brandon that's you know how it's yeah. manifested itself exactly that's kind of where the where his baggage is exactly but, I mean, it could be anything to do with the area they grew up mm -hmm. uh, all the way to the other side of the spectrum. You know, uh, adult abuse, sexual abuse. Sure. Something with their parents, their family. Sure. But you look at Brandon and his reaction to this, and he – the thing that makes me feel like it's really family involved is he runs from everything family-related. Yeah. You know, he uh, – both literally the running, getting back to the aesthetic of the film and some of the – Kind of the metaphorical ideas it's playing right. with but you know his interactions with people who aren't sissy i mean he has this dinner with uh nicole mm -hmm. another great scene where every single line is you know just full of information right but he goes on to develop a little bit he talks about how he can't possibly understand the value of family sure but they hit it off and they hang out again and you know he's trying to change a little bit Mm -hmm. he uh he has sex with her and it's or tries to have sex with her it's the only time we really I think the only time in the movie we see him fail sexually right and that comes back to him attempting to change and not being able to associate sexuality with intimacy right which is i guess one of the reasons that i think you know there could have been uh some kind of sexual event in his past but not necessarily i mean it could just have to do with family Right. It could just be his inability to think or concentrate or get close to somebody right. when he knows that this is a woman who's invested in family. He's thinking about right. you know, the family unit. Exactly. And then you can contrast that to Sissy, who she also seems like she's trying to change, but her primary motivation is just survival. Mm -hmm. You know, her conflict isn't trying to get over things so much as yeah. 
I think she just wants to be around Brandon. Well, I think that Brandon to her represents whatever. I mean, whatever these two have lost, mm-hmm. Brandon represents that to her. Whether right. it's whether it's somebody who's been there, somebody who I mean, if they've grown up together, if she's to go back through her history of human contact, she can definitely ascribe Brandon as someone who was there for her and there sure. with her because as a brother you're in the same fucking house growing up. Yeah, right. I mean, you're going through the same shit. It's the support system between siblings is one of the strongest that you really ever run into. Right. Well, and it seems like now she's trying her best to entangle herself in his life. Right. You know, going back to their past, I mean, he's probably the only one who really understands what they were going through, especially if it was within their own family. Yeah. You know, something like an abusive parent. I mean, he might be, she might feel like he's the only one who understands. Yeah. And here he is running from everything family, which includes Sissy, you know, that reminder of his own family. And she's just, I mean, she fucks his boss. She's trying to just get her talons, and right. then, you know, just grip into his life in any way that, oh, I'll, I'll start a reoccurring sexual fling with your boss so I have an excuse to talk to you and see you and be involved in your life. That also makes me think about what their history with each other is. Right. It's one of those things, like, the movie's called Shame. Mm-hmm. It deals with a lot of uh, sexual issues. And there's that saying... What is it? It's, it's something uh, to the effect of when you have a hammer, every problem is a nail. Yeah. You know, I start to question if there's sexual past between the two of them. Sure. But I don't know if I'm doing that just because we're talking a lot about sex and about family problems. Well, but I think that I think that that it's a that that tactic would not be beyond the subtlety of the film to Mm. talk about sex a whole bunch and never talk about the sexual event that would occur because by implanting sex as a major motivation for the film, you automatically start trying to figure out the sexual nature of each character. Sure. Do you think there's anything to that? I mean, do we have any kind of uh, evidence or indication one way or another if the two of them had any sexual history? Well, I, you know, I... Yeah, I want to say that. I want to say that the film is kind of pointing toward them having a sexual history. Because if you look at the two characters, you can look at them, look at them like two pieces of a puzzle. And Mm -hmm. if if you are to try to find the one character that the film presents us with that seems to fit all the problems that the other character has, uh, you just put Sissy and Brandon together and you realize that, you know... Well, first, there's the moment where Sissy wants to sleep in the same bed as Brandon. Sure. And her treatment of that is almost along the lines of just like we used to. Right, right. Um, Again, don't know if I should read into that sexually or if I should go. She's reverting back to, you know, their childhood state. Yeah. And the other reason that makes me think that there's definitely some sexual history there is it's compounded on top of the fact that Brandon is a sex addict. Yeah. And oftentimes sex addiction, while people will attribute it to troubled past and whatever, and that can exacerbate an issue. I feel like sexual addiction is something that you deal with kind of your whole life. Yeah. And I mean, I use addiction in the not in the, you know, in in quotations. Sure. sure. Addiction. You like having sex a lot. You have a very, very intense sex drive. Yeah. And so I could see Brandon being the type of person that maybe a little bit younger you know, having the type of issues he does, he would, in a moment of weakness, be open to a situation where he has sex with his sister. Sure. And that gets compounded when she walks in on him masturbating. Yeah, right. And he goes off on her at a level that doesn't seem rational. Sure. (laughs) Unless he's pushing very hard against something that's already happened or that he's afraid will happen again. That's one of the most enigmatic moments for me because after to look at how the two characters react to that, sure, he gets really upset. Yeah. But she walks away from the door smiling. Yeah. She walks away from the door. It's, you know, I don't want to try and read into it too much. Sure. But it could be possible that they had some sexual moment when they were younger and she's trying to return to that after he's rejected her. Sure. After maybe he's realized, you know, that 
this is a taboo, uh, you know, sure. not on double feature will I call it an awful thing, but right. you know what I mean? Societally, yeah. a terrible thing that they've done. Sure. He steers away from her and tries to avoid her and she's trying to rekindle, just make any connection back in his life. Right. Well, and if you look at the other thing that's going on in Brandon's life where with the um at the office with the virus and the checking through hard drives <laughs> or right, whatever, right. you already get this glimpse that Brandon is not comfortable owning up to his own sexuality because it's I mean, I understand the professional repercussions of looking at porn at work, but you he's willing to throw somebody else under the bus. He's not right. He doesn't have he doesn't have a handle on his own needs sure and it's not the kind of thing where oh man he's so fucked up and he needs sex so bad he'll get a blowjob from a dude he doesn't even give a shit right right he is doing it and already aware that he's ashamed of having to do it for yeah. whatever reason he's trying to fill a need that he's ashamed he even has yeah and so that's another thing that seems like him swinging back so hard against sissy sure it's just a sign that he feels like he did something very wrong or he is very wrong right um and he's not comfortable owning up to it yeah i guess now that i think about it there's kind of a lot of moments between the two of them yeah i mean he walks into his apartment and sees her in the shower there's right. just a long scene it's very natural for them sure I want to say he sniffs her clothes at some at some well, point. There's there's the moment where she's singing, where he's clearly the camera lingers on him in a way where he's thinking something very yeah. very he's mulling something over very very important. Sure. And whether it's oh my god I'm glad my sister's back or mm, I want to fuck her so hard this is terrible. Yeah, it's pretty incredible thinking now that. You know, people might listen to this conversation and never have even considered sexual history between the two of them. Right. I mean, it also says a lot, I guess, about uh, having a preconceived narrative and looking for evidence of that thing. Sure. It also shouldn't go uh, unsaid that that's an incredible scene, that little singing lounge. Yeah. That was a single take, that scene. Um, yeah. The song about New York, special attention to the city. The uh, the movie all over is just full of New York stuff. I mean, all the sure. floor to ceiling windows. Sure. The infamous hotel, The Standard, which is um, where they're fucking later in the. Right. I don't know if you kind of know the story about The Standard. I don't. It's a fairly um, fairly new hotel, and it's infamous for patrons fucking in the windows <laughs> and people watching from the street. Which I mean, what more, what more perfect thing to include in a sexual right. portrait of New York City? It's just one of those things that, aside from all this character-driven stuff that Shame does, it's special attention to visuals and to, uh, I guess, to the city itself. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting look at New York. We should probably talk about Ji Woon Kim right away in talking about I Saw the Devil. I know. Okay. So he's a director where I know his work and have just been a, I've been a poor film guy and neglected all of it. I just <laughs> add it all to my Netflix queue and say, I'll get around to it. And then meanwhile, well, you've watch. mentioned the good, the bad, the weird, the good, the bad, uh, and the weird so many times on the show. Yeah. And I, I know you've seen A Tale of Two Sisters, haven't you? Yes, that's true. I have seen that one. That's another big one that's escaped our show thus far, but people write to us about that one all the time. He also directed one of the segments for. You remember Takashi Miike did uh, Three Extremes? Yes. Takashi Miike, another director we've right. talked about a lot. I guess there was a sequel to Three Extremes that okay. uh, he did one for. All right. Probably the weirdest thing from his filmography, though, is The Last Stand. Yeah, the Schwarzenegger. Who is that Schwarzenegger and. Um... Johnny Knoxville. Yeah, Johnny Knoxville. Okay. Even weirder than anything we just said is that neither you nor I have seen The Last Stand. Yeah, I didn't realize it came out. Oh, my God. I've been under a rock, man. Yeah, seriously. I thought it's really funny that this movie, um, it starts with that showbox, cartoony, ping pong ball guy for the yeah. studio logos. Yeah. Just way inappropriate for the film. And then that cheery peppermint logo that yeah. comes up. The film has the, the heavy task then of immediately setting the tone, setting the mood to be something a lot darker. Mm -hmm. I mean, that says a lot about how I feel about the film right there. It, it has this constant contrast of light moments and dark moments and kind of a strange sense of humor that it has. Right. You know, we get this set up and it's dark and the woman's alone in the car. And then it cuts to a, uh, a super bright room 
that Kim's in, which feels very safe. Sure. As I'm watching those scenes, you know, the uh, it's a hard thing to do because that might break the tension for the audience. Right. But I really like going back to the safe, brightly lit room with lots of police force in it. it makes right. me feel like everything's going to be okay. And, you know, the movie betrays that. We get our blood in the snow. We get to see the killer. Right. And that's one of those things that's, I mean, that's really going to change our perspective on a movie like this. Kim immediately moves into these vigilante, you know, elements. And as he's going around attacking these usual suspects, we know he's wrong about the first view. Right. Kind of gets your mind working on the themes in advance that sort of... Is this the right thing to do? Right. Is this guy a monster? You know, we see him making the wrong move. Sure. Well, I think it started off with me thinking this is going to be something like Silence of the Lambs. Right. And then as it went on, it felt a little bit more like Taken. And I was thinking about those two movies and what kind of similarities one could draw to make a continuous point with the two films. And I think that one of the things that those films have in common and that I saw the devil brings serious light to is when is it okay to hurt people? And what is sure? At what point do you kind of go, well, they're a criminal. That's fine. You know, cause yeah, right. silence of the lambs is he's a criminal, but we can use him on this one. Sure. And then taken with the obvious, he's just beating the shit out of everybody. Right. And, uh, I feel like I saw the devil really, early on in the film calls into question the morality of every character except for his fiance. Sure. I think she is the only character who we can just assume is entirely good and right. righteous and didn't deserve this. And is it okay for somebody to basically bastardize that and be a horrible person to get revenge? Sure. You know what sure. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so we look at our killer and we look at Kim, and those are our examples of considering what is a monster, what is a villain. Who is the devil? Um, who, who is the devil, right? And that's one of the areas of contrast that's different than, say, the film's humor or, you know, when I say humor, I mean the film has this very measured sense of grief and it's preceded by her head stumbling and rolling out of the box. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. Just these, uh, just these ways it can play off. Uh, it can try and have a little bit of fun, but also consider a very serious thing. Sure. And I, it lets us kind of have our horror fun and, and look good doing it. Look like we're making a, a serious, noble artistic consideration. Right. But I think it also accomplishes, you know, it lets Kim beat the killer to death over and over and right. we don't question his survival. Sure. It's in those repeated beatings that we keep getting this examination. You know, that's one of the unique things it does is we have our revenge moment early on where he beats the killer to death. Right. And then the killer kind of just gets back up. And so at first we just go through one cinematic circle. We go through, oh yeah, I know this. This is a revenge movie. I've seen revenge movies. Sure. Let's all celebrate Kim you know, beating this guy senseless and getting his retribution the first time. <laughs> right. But as we keep getting that over and over, I think that's one of the things that that kind of, I don't want to keep calling it a sense of humor, but you know what I mean? The, the movie's um, superhuman kind of sensibility about these right. characters allows it to do. Sure. Let's look at our killer first. Uh -huh. What's his deal? <laughs> he's, I mean, so he's to contrast him to somebody like, Brandon from the from shame, right? Mm -hmm. He is a one dimensional, horrible person. But it's amazing to watch a character who you think, well, what would a horrible person do? And this guy does right. it and then does one step better. Yeah, he's fresh up off the operating table and decides to rape a nurse. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. This guy, this guy has no qualms and everybody who knows him, the cannibal guy, even sure. So we have a character who eats human flesh three times a day, three square meals of human meat. That's what I eat because it's tasty. Yeah. And he's afraid of this guy. <laughs> sure. You know? <laughs> well, it's also interesting because we spend so much time with the killer. Right. We're really doing kind of a 50-50 thing. So it wants to give us ample room to, I mean, not only have fun following him around and enjoy, you know, seeing mm -hmm. that character, but 
also to go look we're really going to give you every sense of what this guy's thinking and doing right and you're never going to see redemption in him sure we're going to prove over and over you know the thing with the nurse the 360 car stab right the, i mean oh, every so single good. thing yeah everything he does uh is it just leads back to that this person is a monster right but i like in that moment with the nurse uh I love, you know, Kim and him fight and he grabs the blade and squeezes. Yeah. yeah. He just does not give a fuck. He looks insane. Yeah. Which is how the movie's trying to start painting him at that point. Sure. It's this awakening to the audience of, well, wait a second. How how do we feel about Kim? Sure. Because I think there's also room to think in the beginning at least that Kim shows up every time this guy is committing some act of rape and murder, mm -hmm. almost like he's conditioning him. Yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I, I totally get that. Because he doesn't kill him right away. Yeah. So you're thinking, well, why does he, what's the reason? Why does he let this guy live? Sure. You know, what's going on here? And then the guy will go to rape somebody and he'll swoop in at the last second, beat the fuck out of him and then just disappear. Sure. Like maybe he's correcting him or something. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because this film calls into question the idea of murder for revenge or even eye sure. for an eye. You know what I mean? Sure. You take something like a murder and then you take the person who is hurt most deeply by the murder and you let them single-handedly kill the person who killed the person that was dear to them. Right. And then you get that thing that everybody always fucking says in film and in real life, killing them won't bring her back. Yeah. And so at what point do you get the purest revenge where you still feel – where you feel like this has finally – this redeems – the loss of that human being. Sure. It kind of, for me, brings up the whole idea of capital punishment. Is slaughtering this person going to make them a better person? Right. Is it going to change what happened? You know what I mean? <laughs> well, that's the most direct question, right? Because yeah. it, no is yeah. the answer. It's no, not going to change what happened. The answer is always no. You're not going <laughs> right. to change what happened. So the best thing you can do, and this is why I'm really glad you brought up the conditioning thing, and this is what our fucking correctional system is supposed to be doing, right? Is <laughs> yeah. to... Take the person that did it, show them, prove to them, make them realize what they did was the wrong thing to do, and then put them back on the street Sure. as a person sure. who, who did a horrible thing and realizes it was horrible and wishes it would never happen again, and then you get a race of wonderful people, right? That's what's supposed to happen. Sure. So what do you do when you have to classically condition a guy to get his Achilles tendon sliced right, whenever right. he has forced sexual. Sure, sure. If that guy doesn't get conditioned, is it then okay to go, okay, we have sliced this guy's Achilles tendon when he tried to rape a girl. We have broken his hand with a rock. Right. And he still doesn't seem to get the picture. Sure. So is it now okay to decapitate him in front of his family? <laughs> Well, I think the movie also breaks my conditioning hypothesis when you meet the, um, you know, the meat eater. Right. Because he brings up this, uh, this idea that Jang's created a hunter out of Kim. Sure. Somebody who's just enjoying the thrill of following this guy around and fucking with him. I mean, how much does he really have in common with, uh, you know that scene, the the fucking lodge of psychopaths that I love. They just have some yeah. log cam. I mean, is he one of them? Is Kim one of them? Well, that seems to be that seems to be what the cannibal thinks. You know, I there's two ways you can look at it. You can look at it like Kim is the arm of justice, and mm -hmm. he will be exacting, and he will get the truest and purest revenge for taking pure innocence away from the earth, right? Yeah. You can grandize that as much as you want to. Sure. But then you have the flip side of the coin where it's never okay to kill somebody. It's never okay to, you know, make them step on fish hooks, Kevin McAllister notwithstanding. Right. It's a situation where if you are going to start painting Kim as a monster, where on the spectrum of a monster does he lie in comparison with the other people yeah well let me ask the question a little differently maybe so rather than asking if he's one of them you know this is one of my favorite themes of revenge films what sure. are the important differences between kim and say Zhang, for instance right well you have the fact that kim doesn't rape people and okay oftentimes 
something like rape is and it's it's odd because I can't weigh in as strongly as I'd like to. But something like rape is a far more clear cut you're a bad person than right. murder. Sure. Think of think of it like this. If you are on trial for murder, there is actually a situation in which you can convert your plea to something like crime of passion. Sure. And you'll get a lighter sentence. If you call rape a crime of passion. Yes. <laughs> it's an instant guilty verdict. Yeah. Yeah, right. I see what you're saying. Um, sure. Well, and I think a lot of people, I mean, like, I don't want to get into a big thing about it, but I think a lot of people would define rape as being even worse fate than murder. Sure. You know, it's uh, it's one of the worst things a human being I, can do to another human being. Oh, no, I'm, I'm not trying to disagree on that. Yeah, right? absolutely. And so we have. So, all right. So it's not raping. Right. And then I guess also we can, as far as we know, he doesn't kill people. He hasn't killed Shang. He won't. You know, he doesn't kill anybody. Okay, I guess that's also true. He doesn't. Do, <laughs> if you want to be really uh, pedantic about it, um, he never kills him. He just sets up an elaborate trap where he'll probably die. Sure. And then we have the final factor, and this is what I would assume would be the top of everybody else's list. But because you and I are humanists, and we don't think, you know, we think a person is a person first, and then what they are beyond human, you know, their personality sure. or whatever. Sure. That's. He he only kills bad people. You yeah. know what I mean? He kills people who kill people, which something like you take a show like Dexter where the entire premise is it's OK to kill bad people. Right. <laughs> right. right. Um, and that is presented in such a way where you go, well, yeah, because they're going to kill more people. And if one person, if one more person it's a deterrent, yeah, you go, if one more person has to die, if one person's going to die anyway. I'd rather it be the murderer than the innocent victim, right? But what about the torture aspect of it? That's, yeah. That's, I mean, assuming he's not trying to rehabilitate him, which he probably isn't. I don't think he is. <laughs> I think he's trying to do exactly what you previously said, where you and I can agree that rape is probably a fate worse than death. And or then, at least pretty fucking bad. Sure. I, I don't think um, anybody will well, argue here, that line. Let's, let's, go let's with put that. it this. Let's put it this way. Being raped and murdered is worse than being <laughs> murdered. being murdered. Okay, sure. So if he were to just kill Shang, Shang gets off with, ha ha, I didn't get raped. I just got murdered. Right. And Kim isn't just going to rape Shang because then Kim has to live with raping Shang. So you think this is a more accurate eye for an eye? For I him? think I think that is his. I mean, I, as far as I think the film definitely presents, this is this is Kim's getting an eye for an eye for a rape and murder. Right. His his fiance was brutally killed. She was sliced up into little pieces. She was raped. All this horrible thing. And this guy is relentless. Yeah. So the only way to make him just feel the level of pain and horror that his victims have felt is to continually murder him. Murder sure. him time and time again and make him fear that he's going to continually be murdered. Yeah. Well, that's one of the reasons that I like the uh, the concept of, you know, the film showing this guy beaten almost to death so many times, because without actually killing multiple people, it does give the feeling that Kim is just as much a serial killer. We see him essentially kill a guy over and over right? so that we can more, you know, so it's a little more equal footing as far as trying to equate the two. Sure. So, I mean, I guess you have the rape aspect of it. You have the uh, the retribution aspect of it. Those are supposed to make him a, a different kind of monster, if not, you know, not right. a monster right. at all. But I feel like, I don't want to say we're grasping at straws for reasons. These are the reasons the film is presenting. Sure. But the film just wants you to question the two things. And I look at this as uh, these are pretty two awful, sadistic people. I think they're horrible people. people. Just they're, terrible they're very people. Bad people. I mean, the yeah. fact you and I always make jokes about, you know, you take a you take the fucking film's title, right? And you go, who is the or what <laughs> yeah, is right. the or right. who is the real? Who is the real devil? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this film, it wants you to ask that. That is the it kind does. of the point of the film is. Who is the real devil? Who saw the devil? Right, right. Right. Is it is it the one who awoke the devil 
in the man whose fiance was killed or is it the man who came face to face with somebody who rapes and murders for kicks yeah i mean i guess you might even argue that for making kim into such a monster you know shang's an even worse person yeah because he could ignite that in somebody so i i guess those reasons are clearly there and it's for the audience to decide if sure. that really makes this person as horrendous as Perhaps right. you and I would come yeah. on here and go, easily. Obviously, it does. Right. I also like to think, though, that this isn't a revenge film so much as just a film about a man dealing with his grief. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you see him walk away and that uh, the ending is just spectacular. Oh, yeah. Walking away and putting the earbuds in. Yep. The only time anybody's ever looked badass putting little earbuds yeah. in and yeah. taking a stroll. But, uh, you know, and then he breaks down and you see him look... I mean, enormously human compared sure. to the sadistic uh, bastard he's been. And I start to get this feeling that, oh, it was just about the healing process. This is just how one man gets the heavy weight off of his chest happens to be by sadistically stalking this serial killer. Yeah, but then you have to take a look at the trail of bodies that his personal sure. revenge has left. You're right. You're that's, right. That's not, I mean... I get it, and he's a total badass, and he d he came up with a jigsaw like trap that really stuck it to Shang. But well, it, I mean, the other what, FBI or whatever the fuck sure they, yeah. <laughs> they have over there, yeah. Um, the other police officials also give him a ton of grief about sure, you know, because you pursued him like this. Look how many other people he's yeah, killed. Yeah, exactly. And look how he went it's, after us, you know, to a greater degree. Yeah, it's not a point that the film doesn't raise itself. The, film, right, the right. film knows every time that he doesn't kill Shang, more people are being victims. They do yeah. that on purpose. The timeline sure. is such that every time Shang gets up, he does some bad shit and then tries to rape somebody. Yeah. And and that's that's kind of, I think, the most effective point that the film makes is if somebody that you love is taken from you the way that kim's fiance was taken from him there is no real way to eye for an eye doesn't work except it mauling someone sadistically work. via a death trap in front of their family well yeah but i mean that's at the end of how many other people dying sure yeah it, i agree with you and that's where I think that the film kind of lets you think, OK, maybe Shang is the devil because Shang was a terrible person who got the ball rolling on two demons fighting back and forth. Yeah, right. What do you do to try to get revenge for somebody that is taken from you? You can't. And that's that's what the film says to me is the film wraps up with this elaborate trap wherein Shang's head is decapitated in front of his son and parents. Right. Yeah, it's horrible. This is a horrible yeah. thing to do to a human being. And I don't feel vindicated. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, maybe just for the sake of disagreeing with you here, I also feel like seeing his release after that, doesn't that kind of spell out, hey, this worked for Kim. He finally feels you maybe. Know, vindicated. Or he's sobbing because he doesn't. Right. I suppose it could be that. I mean, too. he is. What you have to think about at that moment is he's either, okay, I can finally go to bed tonight, right? I'm right. Finally over it. Or he's going, wow, I just killed that guy and subsequently killed about 10 other people, including my only sure. friends and the remainder of my fiance's family, and this wasn't worth it. So perhaps for you and I, that's a moment of clarity to realize yeah. now the, the horror that he's... Yeah. <laughs> also, just haven't seen that kind of sheer brutality since the, oh, the no. Joyride Hitcher days and I'm on loving the show. It. Fucking love yeah, it. Yeah, just way to go, I saw the devil. Um, we have a website, which is doublefeatureshow.com, and a email address. It's doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Please send us a last chance. Help us come up with incentives for Kickstarter. Well, what are we doing on the show next time? We're going to do Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Finally. And uh, we're going to pair that with Tim Burton's Sleepy Hollow. Awesome. Can't wait for that. Watch more fucking film. Bye. <laughs>